Christmas cracker, helping raise money to meet the needs of the world's poor. That was a long time ago. How long ago was that? I, I, I have no idea. Um, Going by the hair, how long would you say? <laughs> I, it couldn't have been, it must have been about 92 or 91, something like that. I don't know. Is it? All right, okay, 80-something. Anyone something. know? 30 years. Yeah. Oh, so people like me, you know, still in primary school. Yeah. <laughs> I do, I, I didn't really know how to mix stuff then, <laughs> so I, I have no idea how a studio works now. We forget, <laughs> we forget perhaps now when we look back and laugh at those. Actually, at that time, some parts of the church, of course, mm. thought that going on telly mm. was a terrible sin, <laughs> or that social action compromised our understanding of the gospel. You know, the, it, mm. we, we were in a different place then, and mm. there you were doing both at the same time. Yeah, it was, um, I remember, actually, uh, recently I was asked to go and speak in St. Albans Cathedral. Geoffrey John is now the Dean of St. Albans. And um, I spoke at their big St. Albans Day. They paraded through the high street. And it was a fantastic thing. People come from, came from churches everywhere. And, it, and as I was sitting there waiting to speak, it, it cast my mind back to the fact that around this time, actually a little bit earlier, a couple of years, three years, four years earlier, um, there was a huge evangelistic network in this country, which I shall not name, but it, it, it was the biggest, most successful, and probably the richest evangelistic network in this country, linked to Billy Graham, actually, um, not, not legally so. Um, and I'd done some events for them, and I left my church, my, the church I worked for, Tunbridge Baptist Church in Kent, to set up Oasis, and Oasis was about two, three years old, and they were interested in me becoming the director of this thing, which was worth, I mean, they had millions of pounds in the bank besides anything else. And the Bishop of St. Albans was the chair, the then bishop, was the chair of the council that ran this. We went through quite a long negotiation process, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to set up a hostel, a school, and a hospital, and lead a church and preach, etc. And uh, this came to a point where I went with the then chair of Oasis Trust, um, his name's Philip, uh, still a good friend of mine, and we sat, we listened to the council, and the Bishop of St. Albans stood up and he said, young man, he said, we'd really like you to lead this ministry forward, but you must make a choice. It's either the gospel or social work. It's either the gospel or social work. Um, he said, you can't do both. We want you to give up your ambition to run a hostel, because I was just uh, trying to get hold of the first hostel that Oasis ran for young people. He said, but your, the choice is yours. And then there was a coffee break, and, um, and Philip and I stood outside, and there were millions in this, in a giant building, kind of stately home-like. And Philip said to me, Steve, this is wonderful. And I said, Philip, I can't give it up. And he said, why not? He reminds me of this conversation. And I said, because it is the gospel and the bishop just doesn't get it. Anyway, we went back in and we sat there and I had to answer. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't give this dream up. And um, we parted friends. Um, but that never came about. The funny thing is the whole thing shut down years later. Um, they, the money got squandered, I think. And then one of the original trustees came to see me in London and he gave me a check for £15,000. We had dinner. He gave me a check for £15,000. He said, this is the last bit of the money that's left. He said, I'm really sorry that we didn't come with you in the first place. But it, these things, you know, we used to argue, didn't we? I remember listening to a lecture given by John Stott on Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, is anointed me, you know, the piece from Isaiah, and John explaining that this was spiritual good news for the spiritually poor, and the others saw it as political good news for the politically poor and socially good news. This is, you know, when I was a student doing theology, and um, I listened to all this stuff, and I used to think, well, instead of all these 
that I think John was an amazing man. But instead of all these theologians kind of pontificating, why don't they just read the rest of the gospel? Because if you want to know what Jesus meant by good news for the poor, it's best to, as it comes at the beginning of Luke, it's best to read the rest of Luke to find out what he did. And um, if you read the, you don't have to be smart to do that, do you? And if you read the rest of the gospel of Luke, especially the gospel of Luke, You see, this is good news for the spiritually poor, good news for the socially poor, good news for the emotionally poor, good news for the physically poor. This is the holistic shalom that God brings. So it always struck me from the beginning, this is the only way forward. And was it the same with going on telly? Because that was another no-go for some parts of the church, including, to be honest, non-conformists, more evangelical, your end of the church. Yeah, it was really scary going on telly. I always knew, I, I used to say to people... Because, you know, I'm a Baptist, and they used to publish this thing called the Baptist Times. No, not published anymore, it's online now. And, and, you know, you could get on the front of the Baptist Times pretty easy, you know, if you fell... <laughs> oh, sorry. In those days, now it's tough. I mean, basically, if you fell over in the high street, shock news, you know, kind of like... It. No, they were lovely, the Baptist Times. They were really lovely. And they, Oasis owes loads to the Baptist Times. But I remember saying... Someone saying to me, you know, aren't you pleased? I was on the front of the Baptist Times because they were setting up a church planting um, degree course, I remember. And I said, that's wonderful. I want to be on the front of the Radio Times. I want to be on the front of the Times. And they said, that's arrogant. I said, no, it's not arrogant. I want you to be on the front of the Times. I want you to be on the front of the Radio Times because we're all playing in our own little private world, talking to ourselves. No one hears us. Um, so that's a kind of <laughs> thank you very much. And so, yeah, yeah. And and so over the years, uh, it so happened, all sorts of things happened, and I got this opportunity of being on GMTV. I was employed by GMTV, uh, first of all regional ITV, then GMTV, and then BBC One employed me as a presenter, which is really kind of them all. Uh, but the leader of my denomination, um, the general secretary of uh, the Baptist denomination who was a friend of mine, he wrote to me when I first started to put on, on breakfast telly, and he said, Steve, this will be the ruin of your marriage. This will be the ruin of your marriage. Beware. Now, the funny thing is, um, a- about a year and a half later, I was sat in a green room having breakfast with a well-known television presenter, because I got scared of all these women. Do you know, any time anyone came near me, I thought, oh, I'm going to let down the whole Baptist denomination <laughs> and my mum and dad and Jesus. Do you know, kind of like that. And I was really paranoid about it all. Do you know, because I saw them all as worldly and seductresses and all the rest of it. And uh, I was sat in um, a, a green room at ITV, actually, with a well-known TV presenter. And she said to me, Steve, she said, I like you. But when you first came to work with us, you were such an awkward evangelical. You've chilled out a lot. And I think that's our problem. We have to make our mind up whether we love people and we love being part of creation or whether we're some little side comment that's, that's just there to comment on everybody else's behavior and act as judge. But maybe the guy that said that to you about your marriage, maybe mm. that was a helpful reminder. Do you think life would have been different if he hadn't said that? No, I don't think it would have. I, think that it, I don't think it was a helpful reminder. I don't, no, I'm not angry about any of those things. But I just think it, summed up, it sums up the spirit very often of sections of the church that's scared stiff of getting engaged and involved. Um, in actual fact, um, in actual fact, I'd say this, you know, no doubt... I don't know if you're going to ask me about this, my, the, my wonky theology and all of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, so you probably are. But, but um, here's the thing about my wonky theology. The thing is, when I worked in television, I'm so grateful to God for those years that I, I, I still work with the media a lot. I'm going to do some... St- I'm, I actually, my next... Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to meet BBC Three about a documentary we're making after this. So... Um, so, uh, but I worked in telly a lot as a presenter. And what I would say about that, without doubt, 
is that shaped me. I went to Spurgeon's Theological College, did theology, and which was wonderful, New Testament exegesis, Old Testament exegesis, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I went to work in a television studio. And what I discovered, I'd say this, I, I say this to people all the time, I met all these people that the church described to me as backslidden, self-consumed, you know, they, money and sex and power was their thing. That was, the, that was the culture I grew up in. I met in that studio beautiful people, lovely people, broken people, people that needed help and support and advice. All the people I worked in, well, I say all, many of the people I worked it with in telly um, are still my friends now. You know, one of them emailed me, text me, rather, just yesterday about some real issues that are going on in her life right now. I've married some of the people that, that I work with. I've buried their friends and their relatives. I give them thanks for the birth of their children. What I realized slowly was simply this. Somebody summed it up for me. He was floor manager. He was called Tommy. And Tommy simply said to me, Steve, like, we've all got enough problems already without the church. <laughs> and I remember that. I remember that all these years later because it was a profound truth. These people were struggling with life. They had real problems. They had deep, uh, deep um, uh, conversations with them. It's just that they never thought that the church could possibly offer them anything of any help. They were struggling enough already without getting all that guilt and judgment laid on them. And I think that that had a... Pr I, well, it did. I loved those people. To Tommy's died now. I love Tommy. He was a good friend to me. And I learned, I think, a bit more about being human than I'd learned <coughs> up until that time. And you've been vindicated in some ways when we look back mm. um, over all of that time, looking at the quite primitive equipment that you have at Radio <laughs> Tucker. Um, we've come a long way in general. Certainly the church's engagement, for the most part, both with media and with social action, has changed a lot in yeah. the last... 20, 30 years. Um, did you personally have much influence on that journey, do you think? I, I, d I don't know. You know, um, people tell me, uh, um, I, um, I met at, at a BBC thing recently, I took part in, in something with Louise Minchin, who um, is a breakfast presenter, and uh, we were talking about the role of the media in, in, in generating morality. It's a fantastic conference the BBC put on in Manchester, and I was asked to speak at it. And um, Louise told me that one, I don't even know which one it is, but one of the new guys on the breakfast um, um, time presenting, his story is that he got into television because of Radio Cracker. He actually put it on his CV when he applied for the job. So it's a well-known thing around the breakfast time. And I meet lots of people that are uh, broadcasters nationally and, and locally and regionally. Um, so, I mean, we all have influence on, on one another. I am very grateful for this. I, and I say this with great respect. You see, the problem is, I think, that just as we can say that the Christian audience plays to itself, I think the Christian media um, uh, kind of uh, um, environment can end up playing to itself. Do you know, I always used to say when I was in, in, in TV, um, in, in GMTV in the mornings, they'd do research, and up in the, you know, they'd have all these TVs around the wall, do you know? And what they'd be watching was BBC One, and on the tables would be the mirror, the sun, the mail, the express, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you'd watch all the output, and then you'd put your news stories together based on what's in all the tabloids, and sometimes, you know, so, so, some of the broadsheets, and what everybody else was saying. But when you went into the BBC studios, <laughs> they were watching GMTV, <laughs> and, you know, and I, I said... The media can become an animal which consumes its own excrement. 
you know, it, all you're doing is you listen. So that, that's why some of these stories become huge. This morning, I worked on setting up a safe house for 20 um, children arriving here from uh, the jungle. Um, I did it, did it with the Home Office. It's going to be an, an Oasis project. It opens tomorrow. We didn't even have it in place yesterday. But um, we, we're going to take on 20 16 to 18 boys. So I've watched the TV output about how they're all really 30 and they're all cheating and they're all criminals and that. I mean, what a load of rubbish that is. Have you been to the jungle? Have you seen those conditions? Have you seen the dehumanizing impact on young men and women who've escaped with their lives, who've spent a year in mud, who've been dehumanized, who no one cares about? No, the whole of Europe turns its back on this. Mo it's the most outrageous moral breakdown probably since the Second World War. And we're all pontificating over coffee and discussing. That. Have you seen that? So we're taking on these young men. We've set this up with the Home Office in the last 24 hours. And it opens tomorrow. It's a fantastic thing. But, <laughs> but the point is... I had to, even in the end, I won't tell you the local authority we're working with because we're going to run a, just safe in London, safe house. I had, to, I had to convince the local authority involved that this was worth doing. Why? Because they'd, they'd consumed the media excrement. I, I sometimes wonder if sometimes Christian media can further inoculate the Christians to what's going on. So if I get up in the morning and I just consume Christian media and I just listen to Christians talking and I just talk about the issues that are alive in the church, um, then how's my worldview being stretched and broken up? And I think that that's what getting involved in TV ironically did for me. I think there's a challenge in front of us all. As we constantly broadcast in whatever way or narrow cast to Christians, are we helping them into the bigger culture or keeping them from it? I think that's the question we need to debate. You mentioned, obviously, Safe House. That's part of a much bigger organisation that you lead. And you've, for years and years, been on big projects, big teams, very ambitious, achieved mm. a lot. So you've always had lots of people working with you. We've only heard of you. Mm. Do you need to be famous? No, no. Well, I hope not. Yeah, I mean, I can't answer that question, can I? I, 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 I you, you guys can all answer it. I, I never set out to be famous. I, when I was walking up a street in South London at the age of 14. I was on my way home from a Christian youth club that I went to on a Friday night. Um, I went to a dump school. It was a secondary modern school. Please don't return to um, a, a, a kind of this split thing. There is no evidence that it works at all. All it tells is an 11-year-old kid like me, you're rubbish, you're thick. So I was told that literally in my school every day. All of us were told that. But I went to this church, and down at the church youth group, Baptist church, that's why I'm a Baptist, you know, <laughs> and that's the only reason. Um, uh, that <laughs> oh, it is, isn't it? You know, you're an Anglican or a Methodist. You're not an a Anglican because they've got the sharpest view of the New Testament. You're an Anglican because you had some mates that were Anglicans and you got involved. I fancied a girl who was a Baptist, and that's why I went to a Baptist. You know, by the way, I've just been made a canon of the Church of England. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's that. Just, just now. Southwark Cathedral just wrote to me the other day and said they'd like to make me a canon. That was very kind of them. You said get in the back door in the end. <laughs> And anyway, but the point was this. I was on the way home from this youth group on a Friday night, and the girl that I fancied had, let, had told me she didn't fancy me and she would never go out with me. And so I'm wandering past Crystal Palace Football Ground, um, at the club I still support, and I'm thinking, I'm never going back to that church because Mary Hooper doesn't fancy me. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? <laughs> and then I had this thought, and the thought was this. The message they give me down at that church... The story they tell me is a much better story than the story they tell me at my school. At my school, they tell me my life's useless, pointless. I work with my hands. I'm not worth educating, and I'm never going to get a chance to take an O-level. 
down at the church, they tell me I'm made in God's image. My life's got meaning and purpose, even if I never fulfill it. And I remember saying to myself, I know I'm thick, but even I'm not that stupid. I'm going to be a Christian. I so I decided I'm going to be a Christian. Then I thought, if you're a Christian, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'll become a church leader. And when I grow up, I'm going to set up a hostel for kids to give them housing who've never been told they matter, and a school worth going to, and a hospital. And I got in, my dad used to work on the railways, he was out, my mum was in, and uh, she said, what have you done? And I said, I've decided I'm going to be a Christian, a church leader, and I'm going to set up a hostel, a school, and a hospital when I grow up. So, uh, so I had the gift from God of that revelation. It didn't come from me. Yet it came from outside of me. It's a gift of grace, isn't it? And all I've tried to be through the ups and downs of life, and there are many of them, is faithful to that. It's my true north. So, yeah, Oasis in this country employs just over 5,000 people. Um, it's, it's the 15th biggest charity in the country. It's the fastest growing charity. I only know this because charity commissioners tell you this all the time. Um, it's, it's massive. And I've had the privilege of being part of it at the start. I always say to them, by the way, the best kind of founder is a dead one. It's fantastic, because if you've got a dead founder, you can fundraise against it. You know, you can have a fun founder's day, stick their picture up, tell all sorts of nice stories about them, and no one ever gets to find out the truth. Whereas, <laughs> whilst they're alive, they're a bit of a pain, aren't they? So, uh, that's the story. Speaking of being a bit of a pain, um, you're not only known for telly and social action. Mm. And so, you've caused a lot of controversy, haven't you, in the last few years? <coughs> talking about what happened on the cross, your mm. understanding of theories of atonement, mm. then talking about same-sex marriage. Are you expecting the church to catch up with you in 20 years like we did on the other things? Uh, no, not necessarily. I'm one, we are the church. We're a conversation. If you read the Bible, which of course isn't a book, it just looks like a book for the last 300 years since we've had the printing press and the popular printing, it's a library. You know, if you miss the fact it says it's a library on the front cover, you just open the first page and it says the books of the Bible, the books of the library. It's a library. It's different voices at different times. And actually, if you read, you know, everybody says they read the Bible, but if you read the Bible, you find out that Nehemiah doesn't agree with Isaiah about who should be part of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah definitely wouldn't agree with the content of the book of Ruth. And you'll find out that Matthew and Luke don't agree about how Judas met his end, etc., etc. It's a library. If it was a book, everybody would be worried about contradictions, but it's a library. It's like walking into a library. Now, when the canonization process <laughs> happens, which happened in a very complicated way over a long period of time. So forgive me insulting your intelligence here, because I know you know it wasn't a bunch of guys in a room who sat down and said, we'll have those 27 <laughs> books and not those. Um, but when canonization, through the process of canonization, to, was it a bunch of guys who sat in a room and go, well, do you know, let's have those 66 in for the Protestants. We'll have a few more for the Catholics, but we'll have those in for the Protestants for now. Let's not bother reading them. I'm sure it'll all be okay. They'll all agree. <laughs> or did, through the centuries that took place, wise people read every word of this and say, well, Isaiah's got a different view to Nehemiah on this. And um, Luke doesn't always agree with Matthew. And what Paul says to the at Corinthian church, he doesn't say to the church in Ephesus. Did they say, oh, well, we can't do that? No, they put them all in there because the Bible is a library. It itself is a conversation. So it ushers us into a conversation and it asks us to think and ask questions. When I raised the question about um, uh, human sexuality, uh, literally, if you read my stuff, I say, I'm raising a question. I'd like to ask a question. This is, I, I remember the lines because I was so careful. This isn't the last word. It's probably not the first word either. It's just me asking these questions and telling you how I feel about it. 
It was like, do you know, I was chucked out of this and that and, you know, all the rest of it. People have never spoken to me again. What kind of immature community cannot have a conversation without telling one another we're all going to hell? But surely there's a difference between critical thinking and really you went into that. You must have known how much pain it would have caused some people. I'm shocked you say that. I guess you're saying it because you're a journalist. We, you know, I'm, I am truly shocked. Let me tell you some facts, right? Tell, tell you some facts. Brit English public health, uh, English public health, London School of Tropical Medicine, etc., etc., etc. We know that the most, the most likely person in our society to commit suicide is a young man under the age of 30. Six times more likely to commit suicide than most other age groups. We know that that suicide rate is at least doubled if you are homosexual. At least doubled. We also know, we know, this is empirical, scientific, medical fact. We know that if a gay man is, we now know, if a gay man is in a stable, committed relationship with another gay man, the incidence of suicide, stress, uh, eating disorders, self-harm, depression, all fall dramatically. Not right back to those of a straight man, but they fall dramatically because we need intimacy and belonging. And I believe it's a crime that the church has not given to same-sex couples the opportunity to belong to a lifelong, committed, faithful relationship, but rather has forced them to keep quiet or pretend they can all be uh, celibate forever and pushed them into a life of silence about who they are. If we are going... I, I would say this, I'm a conservative. I am a conservative. I believe in marriage. I believe in marriage, and it's because I believe in marriage that I believe that the church must find a place for gay, uh, same-sex, lifelong, faithful relationships. Promiscuity is always wrong. Sleeping around is always wrong. It has to be, because it's not like God. It's not faithful, it's not loving, it's self-centered. And, and the Bible urges, Jesus says, be like your heavenly Father. Paul says, be like Jesus, love, be faithful. It's, promiscuity is nothing to do with faithfulness, it's to do with self-centeredness. But we must find a place for, the, for this to be celebrated in our churches. And don't give to me the next line, that really I've not read the New Testament. Don't give me all that stuff. There's my good friend Tom over there, whom, whom supported me when I wrote about the atonement. In fact, Tom, thank you, I've said thank you to Tom many times, wrote a whole book in my support which was really good of my view on the time. <laughs> yeah, well, it, uh, yeah, no, 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 it did. And you know, Tom's quote about his support for me, I've seen it endless times on websites, more times than that my text, but I was grateful for Tom for, uh, for stepping in. I was doing a debate with someone about around the gay uh, thing recently, and then the chair of the debate, uh, somebody was laying into me, you know, uh, with a PhD in theology, laying into me about didn't I understand this Greek word and that. I think I probably did better than him, to be honest. But the point is this, um, he, then the, the master of ceremonies said, oh, and you have another problem with Steve, um, his rejection of penal substitution. And this guy comes from a denomination that had rejected it. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. We totally understand what Steve was saying about that. It's amazing what a decade and a half difference makes, isn't it? But, but I, would I would say this. You know, I, Tom and I have talked about this. And I've said to Tom, uh, you know, why don't we publicly, because Tom has a different view of me, why don't we publicly debate the theology? Why don't we look at the New Testament words? Why don't we together stand there and debate this theology? We cannot escape into poor, shoddy, inconsistent theology, which allows us to give a platform to women, even though the Pauline writer, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting technical now, the Pauline writer to, uh, of 1 Timothy says, women cannot speak in churches because Adam was created before Eve. So the writer appeals to the creation story for why women shouldn't speak in churches. We cannot 
wriggle our way around that, and I don't think you should wriggle your way around it, I think you should deal with it and the hermeneutics of that, but you can't get around that one and then say, oh, but here's this, this passage in Romans 1 or wherever it is, or Jesus says a man should be married to a woman when he was actually addressing a completely different theological questions about Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, which most people don't know. It was a technical, Tom knows well, but it was a technical issue to do with something that happened in that society, which we didn't know in fairness till about 40 years ago since the Dead Sea Scrolls and all the rest of it. But what we do is we do shoddy theology and then we condemn people. So when the pastor stands up and says, you can't be in a health, uh, healthy, lifelong, committed relationship, that pastor has probably changed his view or dead when that person in their old, old age sits in a room on their own and has been denied the depth of human relationship. I don't feel passionately about this at all. Do I? <laughs> One final question from me before we open it up. I think what we can agree on, um, all of us, is that, Steve, when you talk, when you speak, people listen. <laughs> and we can see that through the things that we've talked about, whether they come towards you or away, the point Ooh. is they listen. I'm wondering, do you have your own parameters? Do you go through a process when you're interested in something? And do you rule things out? Do you rule things in? What's your defining mission in terms of what you want to speak and what you want people to engage with? I, I, I think that life's a journey. I'm, I'm, I'm chasing after Jesus all the time. And uh, I, my, when I was first a Christian, I would have said, I want to follow Jesus with all, all I'm worth. I'm now 60 years old, and I say, I want to follow Jesus for all I'm worth. But my understanding of who Jesus is, my Christology, is it, it's changing, isn't it? My Christology, my understanding of Jesus, drives my sense of purpose and my sense of mission in the world. But my sense of mission means I engage in certain projects, you know, so you get involved in the data. I get involved in developing oasis, running schools, running hostels. I get involved in running food banks and uh, uh, setting up, I mean, we run all sorts of things, farms, and, and, and uh, we just opened a hairdressing shop to create employment in a town. We le I lead a church in the inner city of London. It had 10 people in it. It, it has hundreds of people in it. I, I, it's culturally diverse. You know, London is a melting pot. So all of that practice then trickles down and informs my Christology. And my new Christology informs my missiology. And, and so it, it's like that. So it's that ongoing journey. But I'm only one voice in this giant conversation. And I don't believe the conversation is between us in this room or us on this planet. I believe that before us, I know, I don't believe this, this is true, isn't it? Before us have gone great thinkers. Do you know, so if you're in the world of, of theologians, you're thinking, you know, Bonhoeffer and Barth, do you know, to name just two, but Augustine, do you know, and Tertullian, and it, some of these names may mean something to you and not. But, uh, do you know, and, but I am just one little voice in that huge, giant conversation, which is the church. If I despise the voices of others who disagree with me, I'm a fool, for they've something to teach me. But if they despise my voice and shut me out, they're fools, for we are no longer that giant conversation that is multi-generational and runs through history. I do believe in the end, I, I know that I was talking to Tom, and Tom was talking about the church and media, um, you know, and I, I, I wish I'd have been here, honestly, but I had to go and do this... Um, this thing with the Home Office, and, um, and, and, and the, the thing is this, I'm sure Tom says this, you know, the media is the message, isn't it? And the media keeps changing, which is why we believe the Bible's a book at the moment, because it always looks like a book, or mostly looks like a book in our culture. But the thing is, the medium is the message. God became man through Jesus. Jesus didn't just look like God, he was God on earth, human. I, we're coming up to uh, celebrate Christmas, of course, and then we always say the incarnation is that God became a man. And I always think, no, it's not. That's kind of, that's kind of a minimal light version of incarnation. Incarnation is this, that God became a particular man speaking a particular language with a particular color skin, knowing particular people, crying at particular uh, graves. Uh, he was part of a family in a village. He was earthed and embedded 
So it strikes me that our earthness and our embeddedness is always going to have an impact on our overall understanding of life. The medium for God was to be human. It's great that we have the opportunity of writing electronically or on paper or broadcasting about Christ, but actually the real medium God chose was feet and hands and sweat. So our engagement in communities is always going to give the greatest depth, it seems to me, to our conversation and our thinking. And just, so, so why did I first come to, um, to have my thoughts changed around gay people? Because I took on a church in central London with 10 people in it that was open for an hour a week. And Vauxhall, gay capital of South London, unknown to me then, but now known to me well, was just down the road. And I, there are 10 elderly people, and I used to pray that more people would come. I used to do this in my spare time around this church, pray, pray, pray. And, you know, young people would come, and they'd say how wonderful it was. But I knew they weren't coming back, because it was a big old building that seated 400 with 10 elderly people, mostly in their 70s and 80s. They weren't coming back. And then this young man came in his 20s, and he came back the next week. It was wonderful. And he came back the week after. And then he said, he said, Steve, he said, you're doing everything. I was doing everything. He said, could I welcome people? Wow. Like, yes, you can. So I let him back. And then he said, why don't I do coffees afterwards? Wow. And then a few more people started coming because he was there. More young peop younger people came than 70, if you see what I mean. And younger people came. And then, they, and then he said, shall I organize a rota? And I said, yeah. And then he sat down with me. He'd done theology, actually. He's got a degree in theology and a very famous evangelical father. And he said, Steve, you might wonder why I've come to this church, which I'd often wonder, to tell you the truth. <laughs> he said, it's because I'm gay. But I love Jesus, and I've been rejected. And he told me his horrific story. And he said, now I've told you this, will I be welcome next week? What would you have said? That's when your theology, your Christology, is driven by your engagement and your incarnation. OK, that is a giant conversation. We've got 15 more minutes of giant conversation. <laughs> um, we're going to take questions. And as before, can you let us know who you are when I call on you for a question? And a question, not a statement, please. So who's going first? Hazel. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hazel Southern, what's next? For me? You've done, yeah, for you, you've done hostels and farms and everything. Yeah. What's next? I think that, that um, we've just set up something which is called the Oasis Foundation, and it exists just to give away what Oasis has learned. So um, I'm uh, in this country beginning to advise dioceses. Uh, do you know, I, I happen to think Church of England is, is, is by far the best. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an Anglican. I think it's by far the best organized denomination in this country. I, I, um, Richard Chartres, the, the Bishop of London, in, by the way, invited me to breakfast to discuss strategy across North London. And uh, there was a bunch of um, Anglican leaders there, and me, do you know, and they all chatted away, and I had a nice bacon sandwich. And, um, and then he said, uh, you've not said anything, Steve. And I said, well, you know, I've just been... Well, I said, I've got two things to say, but I, and I, I won't tell you what the second one was. It was comment on their strategy formation. But I said, I've not said anything because I'm overawed. I said, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist minister. I've never been in a room ever where two Baptist churches have worked together on a joint strategy, ever. And yet I'm here in this room where a whole denomination is working together across a major part of a city. I said, it's fantastic. It's, um, it's fantastic. Oasis has now got involved in, in, so we're working with several dioceses around the country to help them think through housing policy, educational policy, joined up how you work with government, how you work with government without losing your soul, how you think about your governance. You know, uh, often we have to face it that Christian schools have ended up as places with a cross on the wall and, and you force the kids to sing a hymn every morning or send them to a Eucharist once a term. But actually, where's the Christ-likeness in it? Is this an inoculation against ever catching real faith 
or is it embedded in the character of Jesus? So we're beginning to work with dioceses around that. I'm working on a huge peace project for 2018. I'd love to talk to you. I'd love, to be in, uh, I, I'd love to, uh, you to be involved with the BBC and uh, with Coventry Cathedral, Southwark Cathedral, Liverpool Cathedral, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, various other people, the Quakers. Um, I think that Oasis, Oasis is just going to build a health centre here in central London, uh, working with uh, it for 14 to 21-year-olds, looking at physical health, because uh, young people drop out, you know, and they only ever show up in acute care in A&E. Um, so we're looking at um, physical health, mental health, the mental health of young people in our country. You know, it's the, I'm, I'm sure there are one or two com church commissions looking at it. We should be, you should be broadcasting about it and talking about it, and their, their, their sexual uh, health as, as well. I do, because I'm old and I live in London, I do an increasing amount with government. I seem to be forever appearing in front of select committees. I've been in front of a select committee this week, the other week, you know, kind of, it's a funny old club, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, hey, hey. Tim Laval. Hello, um, yeah, Tim Lavelle, work at the BBC. Um, so I've been sort of struggling to work out how to phrase this question. Um, so, you know, you were a role model for me in terms of myself going into the media because I, uh, because I thought what you did was great. And I've, it's always been important to me that there are Christians in the media, visibly in the media, who can be good role models yeah. to, to non-Christians, to anyone. And I think it's important having Christians in the media, obviously. It seemed to me that in the 90s, you were on TV quite a lot. And then in the 2000s, kind of less on TV. Yeah. Uh, and obviously you're doing, you know, setting up or running this huge growing charity, you know, appearing in front of select committees, having influence in other ways. But I wonder, you know, this is going to sound sycophantic, <laughs> but, you know, you're good on TV. Is it important that you, did you, did you feel you were less on TV? What do you think that was oh. about? Yeah. And actually, is it important that if you are a Christian, kind of with all those openings, you actually do keep pursuing those openings to be on yeah, TV. In other words, yeah. what I'm sort of saying is if, if you actually are good on TV, you should be on TV. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's a really uh, kind thing to say and a helpful question. I'll tell you why I pulled out television. Because, because it started with bits and bobs. And in the end, I was, I, was, I was contracted to BBC, contracted to GMTV, contracted to various regional ITV things, and also presenting a series on Radio 4. And I knew that Oasis was in decline. I knew it was in, and I, I don't think other people saw it, in fact, that, you know, cause, because the, pro the problem is always a decade before it's noticed, isn't it? And, but I knew we were in decline. I knew that we'd stopped growing, we'd stopped moving forward, we'd stopped pioneering. We were living off what we'd done the year before and the year before and the year before. And it was a really hard time for me um, because I had to make the deliberate decision. Now, the other thing is, politicians love media people. Media people love politicians. It's kind of fantastic. It's true, isn't it? And so I'd met lots of politicians who'd invited me to loads of things because they loved being on TV. But I was interested in the work they were doing. And I knew that there was a revolution coming to our schools in this country. And I'd been to see a guy called Ron Deering, Lord Ron Deering, um, Church of England uh, member and member of the House of Lords who'd been commissioned by the then uh, Archbishop, who I don't know who was, who that, that's probably George Carey, I can't remember. But anyway, been commissioned by the Archbishop to produce a report on the Church of England schools. And because I was in the media, they invited me along as well. And I listened to Ron Deering speaking in, in his house, North London. I listened to him speaking and I thought, when I was a kid, I wanted to set up, you see, a hostel, a hospital, and a school. That's what I wanted to do. I just see media as a platform. You know, it's a platform to talk and be part of the mix. But I knew I couldn't do the two. I had to really throw myself into one or the other. And so I decided that, yeah, I liked being on telly. I loved it. It was fantastic. I love, you know, I love that world. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a joy to me. But you have to decide in life what you're supposed to do, and what you're supposed to be, do might not be the same thing as what you want to do. And so I chose to leave. Um, Oasis, when I left, probably had 150 staff. Today it's got over 5,000 staff. 
um, and worked in 11, uh, 10 other countries of the world. Um, so it, it's growing very fast. It's going at a phenomenal rate now. Uh, in our schools, our GCSE and what's called Progress 8 results, that's the new measure, by the way. Nobody's interested in GCSEs anymore. Progress 8. If you don't know what Progress 8 is, learn. <laughs> because if you want to broadcast about education, you've got to know about Progress 8. Our Progress 8 results were fantastic compared with much of the country. And at the moment, we're in conversation with 18 new schools all becoming part of Oasis. Um, we're getting conversations about all sorts of things. And for me, that's great because I might have been a voice in media, but actually it's I, to, see, to see communities thrive and flourish. Why was that I in the media? It was to talk about the church being a catalyst for bringing transformation to individual lives and communities. What Oasis is doing is bringing transformation to individual lives and communities. But I'm still, you know, I'm still glad I'm going off to... Uh, actually, the documentary I've been asked to make by BBC is about the church's attitude to LGBT people. Um, so that won't be controversial. <laughs> Part of it's going to focus around, in two Sundays' time, we're going to do a renaming ceremony um, for someone who's transgender in our church. Um, uh, who's become a man and wants to have a renaming ceremony for who they really are. And before you're already screw really screwed up by that, the issue of LGBT is a strange thing because L and G have nothing to do with T. I mean, they're just completely different worlds. Why would anybody ever put them? To it's like saying, you know, Brits and everyone else, Gentiles. Transgender, so this person was born intersex. It means they have both sets of sexual organs. Their parents made the decision to raise them as a girl, and they had an operation, physical. But of course, actually, they're wired differently. This guy says that all he ever wanted to do was be a mechanic. Excuse me. <laughs> all he ever do was wanted to do was be a mechanic and play with... Uh, play with cars, and he le lived his, the first 20 years of his life in utter guilt because his parents had committed Christians. And then he went to his parents uh, and he said, because he was a girl, he said, I want a sex change, I want to be a man. And he thought they'd have a meltdown. And his mum sat him down and said, well, actually, when you were born, you were intersex, and we chose for you to be a girl. And I've always thought it was the wrong decision. I bet that story has made some of you think. It should. And it should make you ask. So even if you're sure that Romans and 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy condemn homosexual people, that has nothing whatsoever to do with the issue, issue of transgender. I don't know how I got onto that. From, <laughs> oh, because, because we're going to make, make a program with BBC about it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Final question. Cindy, did you have a... Uh, yeah. Just wait, wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Did Mary Hooper ever find out what she missed out on? <laughs> I still know Mary. Yeah, she's called Mary Beckingham. She's got five kids and endless grandchildren, and she lives in Canada. And her husband is a theologian, and yeah, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> she's wonderful, and still as beautiful as ever. Yeah. Well, that was a lovely brief question, so there is time for another one. Did anyone else? Yeah. Uh, James, yeah. Steve, hi. Um, to kind of build on the question that came before the one about Mary, which is lovely to, to know. Um, is, so if you're not on TV as much, do we need more famous Christians? I'll just put, you can answer that however you like. Sure. I, th I, think, we, I think we need more Christians to, to be involved and to be influential. The media is one way of being influential, but I think that, you know, we, we're called to be light and salt, aren't we? We're called to not hide our... our, our, our candle under a cover. We're called to be the bright light, shining stars in the universe. We're called to be the first fruits, to live out the coming kingdom of God. That, you know, you can't escape that, can you? Jesus said, and when you pray, 
pray, our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. The implication is through us. Jesus goes on to ask for food and then on to ask for forgiveness. Uh, you know, and forgive us our sins but, and our debts. But it begins with, you're called. When you pray, you're called to bring in the now and not yet of the kingdom, the incoming kingdom. So we need to be engaged. We need to be engaged in the media. We need to be engaged in politics and medicine and industry, etc., etc. We need to be engaged. And sometimes what worries me is that we, we run our own little internal world with our own versions of everything because we're not actually engaged in the big version, the real world, the messy place. Do you know, I know so many people who've not been successful in things in big society and have actually retreated into doing the same job in, in the Christian world. I think that the challenge to be involved in, the, in media is a huge one, and I take Tim, isn't it? Tim, did Tim, I take what Tim says seriously, and I know that, you know, uh, whilst God gives me breath, we're all passing, we're all temporary. Anybody my age, by the way, who's trying to be famous or build an empire is really quite short-sighted, aren't they? It's hardly <laughs> worth it. <laughs> you know, you know, have you not looked at how old I am? So it's our job to invest in others. So yeah, I, I do need to be involved in media things, but we all need to push ourselves beyond our boundaries instead of let our world shrink, do you know, and say, oh, I've got my nice little secure place here and I'm broadcasting to a bunch of people who already believe exactly what I believe. Well, actually, that's not broadcasting, that's narrow casting. So what are we doing about real engagement with, with the constant conversation and debate which is society and globalised society. Brilliant. That's a great place to end. Going to breakouts next. The um, rooms will come up on the screen to remind you. But first, can we all say a big thank you to Steve Chalk. Thank you.